Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. It's been a week full of stories about who's in and who's out in telly, so let me be clear. Sophie's just taking a break and the bosses here thought that on a Sunday bank holiday weekend you might appreciate a bit of Sky's answer to Antiques Roadshow. I'm Trevor Phillips. Sky's hit show Succession builds to a climax this week, this morning, Westminster's writing its own dramas. Suella Braverman reckons her thriller, Stop the Boats, might pull in the viewers. In TV, we usually want more people on board. The Home Secretary wants fewer foreigners landing here. Some of her political rivals are working on a very different script. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, wants more, less well-paid workers to keep the wheels of the economy turning and inflation down. But over in Emergency Ward 10, the Department of Health, they're tearing their hair out because the hospital set's falling apart and there just aren't enough doctors and nurses to play all the parts. And on the rival network, Labour, they've been trading new shows for months. More doctors, more houses, more jobs. But they're yet to tell us much about how they're actually going to deliver. Still, it's a year or more before we know who's going to top those election ratings. Stay tuned for 60 minutes of gripping viewing. In just a moment, we'll hear from the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay. And for Labour, I'll speak to the party's Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth. With new claims about Boris Johnson and plenty of other stories of sleaze once again in the papers, we'll talk to the Chair of the Standards Committee, that's Labour's Chris Bryant. Someone likely to ride to the defence of the former Prime Minister is the Conservative arch-Brexiteer, Andrea Jenkins. And we'll try to cut through the political noise about immigration following those record net migration figures this week and get some facts from the chair of the Migration Advisory Committee, Professor Brian Bell. There's been a flurry of announcements from the Health Department this week. Everything from more patient choice to use of technology. But the fundamental problems in the NHS, crumbling buildings, staff shortages and pay disputes, plus huge backlogs and waiting lists that remain the, remain the big worries. So let's start this morning with the government. And just a few moments ago, I spoke to the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay. You promised to rebuild five hospitals by 2030 because they're full of this particular kind of con concrete that will make them now fall down. Um, some of the other hospitals that you promised to rebuild are now going to be delayed. So what about the other 29 that the NHS has, uh, has already identified as liable to collapse? Well, we were clear in our manifesto we were going to build 40 new hospitals and the statement on Thursday made clear that that's exactly what we're going to do. But of course, what NHS leaders have said to us is those five rack hospitals, as you say, the ones with concrete where there is a risk, uh, a risk to the building fabric, it's right that we prioritise those. So, of course, we're following the evidence, and the evidence shows that those five hospitals are priority cases. It's right we respond to those. The ones that uh, are then impacted by that are still part of the new hospitals programme. It's just they may not be completed by 2030, which is the original uh, target date we set in the manifesto. So we're committed to those hospitals. They're still part of the programme. We'll be working on them and starting enabling works on those schemes. But it's right we prioritise the RAC hospitals because there's a, an urgent need to do so. So to be clear, and there's no shame in this, you are not going to fulfil your 2019 manifesto pledge of 40 new hospitals no, by we 2030. No, we are going to... By 2030. We are going to fulfil it by 2030. That's what we were very clear. Five hospitals are coming but, into that scheme which will be completed, and I'll tell you how. It's by embracing modern methods of construction in a similar way to the way that we have in education, in the Ministry of Justice with prisons, as is common in the private sector. Yeah, so I'm, building much more in factories, using modern methods of construction, that speeds up I, both I, the approval I get, of those schemes, but also the construction... Uh, time of those schemes. I, I so we're get bringing all, those into the programme. I get all that. You can, do th you can do new things. I started life as an engineer, so I knew mm. things mo move on. But just to be clear, I thought you just said that you would not be able to make 
build those 29 other new hospitals to get your target to 40 by 2030. Well, will, will there be 40 new hospitals by 2030 or not? Right, there will be 40 hospitals by 2030. 40 new hospitals. 20 of these schemes in the programme will start construction next year. A number already have. And will they be completed by 2030? The commitment is for 40 new hospitals by 2030. We're bringing in the rack hospitals within the scheme because independent reports... Rack have being the, the kind of type like of Kingsley, concrete involved. Hinchinbrook, Bury St Edmunds, uh, they're urgent uh, and we need to address those. So we're, just to be clear, all 40 are going to be uh, spanking new hospitals open for business by 2030. There'll be 40 new hospitals in line with the announcement in 2020 where there was a number of cohorts, cohorts two, three and four. The cohort one schemes were already uh, underway. Those schemes will now proceed, the cohort two schemes, for example. You're not in quite the telling me that they'll be ready by 2030. Well, I think I've been clear. There will be no, 40 you, you... schemes complete by 2030. They will include the five rack hospitals. There were some within the list that will be part of a rolling programme that will go beyond, uh, but that's because five have been added to the 40. All right, we could go on about the, the chop the words for, for, for all morning, but let's, I, I let's, let's, let's not... The house, let's not quite let's, a bit of detail in that okay, statement, if it's helpful. Indeed, uh, indeed. So, um, the, the problem with, the, with this pledge is that you did say you'd build this 40 new hospitals, you're now telling me it's going to happen. You originally said that there'd be an eight of them built by 2025. So far, you've managed two. It's not that persuasive that uh, you're going to build the 40 by 2030, given that you haven't even got the 8 by 2025. It's a very fair challenge, and let me explain why uh, we're changing our approach as a result. Nine of the last 10 hospitals built in England were over time and over budget. Uh, and that's because what quite often happens is as the scheme starts, the spe specifications are changed. People come along with their bells and whistles and want to change what's in the scheme. By taking more time and having a standardised approach, what's called the Model 2.0 Hospital, so a standardised approach that allows us to bring all that expertise into one design, then go out to market and have the economies of scale that the NHS offers. And this is something that's very common in the private sector. We've already done it in education and in prisons. It is a fundamentally different approach for how the right. NHS will build its buildings, but that's how we will accelerate the programme, by using modern methods All right. of construction. OK, we will revisit this, or somebody who's sitting here will revisit this <laughs> with you in a year's time. Um, now, at the RCN annual conference, Pat Cullen, General Secretary, said that you'd emailed her and agreed to meet. How did that meeting go? Oh, we had a very constructive meeting uh, this week, uh, working with Pat. Pat obviously was uh, deeply involved in the original negotiation. She recommended that deal to her own members. She said that it constituted real Yeah, they progress. said no, though. Well, she negotiated the deal uh, with me and the rest of the staff council. Uh, she said it was real progress, uh, tangible uh, way forward. Yeah, no matter what she said. Her members said they didn't like it. They want more than 10%. Are you going to give it to them? Uh, well, the NHS staff council agreed to the deal. So the majority of health unions uh, accepted uh, the AFC deal. Uh, that's why that will go into pay packets uh, in June, because we hugely value the work that NHS staff do. That's why we made yeah, the offer the, of 5% plus. Yeah, but she, she's coming back for more. She said there's going to be more strikes. Uh, this morning, are you saying to Pat Cullen, doors open, we're, we're, we're going to move towards your, t your art target, more than 10%, or are you saying to her, look, you know, the, the staff council decided this, you're getting the money, that's it, forget it. I'm saying what Pat herself said, which was it's no, a no. fair and final... Well, I'm asking what you what you're yeah. saying. Yes, yes, and, and, and being consistent, and what Pat said at the time that the deal went to members was exactly the same as what I said and what the rest of the NHS staff council said, which was as a fair and final settlement, a 5% uh, pay increase plus a lump sum. It means a band six uh, entry nurse gets over £5,000 
over the two years, recognising the huge, valuable contribution that NHS staff have made. Okay. Now, what some in the RCN are asking us to do isn't legally possible. It's not possible to give a band six nurse a different pay to a band six midwife or a okay. band six paramedic because uh, their grades okay. that are Before... rated, their jobs that are evaluated in the same way. But Pat herself said this was real progress. She recommended the deal. Indeed, I, I, she negotiated We, we, we all deal. know what Pat said, but what matters is what her members said. Mm. And they said they do not like the deal that uh, you've negotiated that has been accepted by the Staff Council. They are a big union. And whatever, it was about a third what, whatever, of what, whatever It was only Pat, about a third. Yeah, it was okay. a very whatever, narrow vote and it's a small number. Whatever Pat may or may not have said to you in your meeting, the point is her members don't like it. And what you're telling me, and I'm, uh, forgive, you know, tell me I'm, I'm wrong, the words I've picked out of your answer there are full and final. What you're saying to them is, that's your lot. Well, we're going to make that payment in June to all uh, over a million. Uh, no, you've told me that, but staff. this is the, you're, you're not going back to the negotiating table with the RCN. Well, not on the amount of pay. There's things in the deal that we agreed with the NHS Staff Council, where there is further work around pay progression, uh, around uh, yeah. violence against staff, around pension abatement. There's various things okay. within the deal, and we've agreed a package of work with the NHS Staff Council to take those forward. But this is okay. something that the Staff Council as a whole voted on. Unions like Unison, uh, over 70% supported okay. this deal, uh, and we will get this payment out to people in their June settlements. OK. Um, one of the other things uh, in that discussion with the nurses is the long delayed workforce plan which you promised in November 2018. Any chance we're ever going to see that? Well the Chancellor committed to the long term workforce plan in the autumn statement. Uh, it is a big complex uh, set of proposals. It's right that we take our time uh, to get the detail of that uh, right. Uh, we Four. will bring that out uh, soon. But it needs uh, uh, to... Uh, hang on, hang on. When is soon? Four well, and a half and years uh, is not soon. Uh, well, it was announced in the autumn statement that we were bringing this forward. Obviously, we've had, <laughs> a, pan in November we've had, a, we've had a, a pandemic and various things that have been happening in recent years. But the autumn statement gave a commitment from the Chancellor to have a long-term uh, workforce plan. It's something that colleagues in NHS England have been working intensely on. We need to look at both the additional numbers and how we grow our domestic, domestic workforce, but also what reforms we can put in, in terms of using our skills mix better, using new roles within, uh, within the NHS in different ways. So it is a complex piece of work. It's right we take our time uh, to get it uh, as it should be, uh, but we will bring that out very soon. I, I, I... I, I respect your, your answer, but when you say take your time, you've already taken four and a half years. The Chancellor's committed, OK, fine. Is the Chancellor committed to paying the money that any workforce plan... Don't go into the detail, but it's going to cost you money. Has he committed to paying for it? Well, of course, any uh, expansion of uh, domestic workforce will come at a cost. There's a cost in terms of the, the training itself. There's a cost from uh, higher numbers in terms of uh, the pay for those roles as well. But it's also about looking at what reforms we can bring yeah. forward as part of that plan. But of course, these are discussions we have on a cross-government basis, and that will be part of Hel the announcement. Health Secretary, I, I can sort of hear a sound there, and it feels like the sound that I associate with cans being kicked down the road again. Now, I'll be very clear, the, the plan will come out very when? shortly. It will be shortly. Before I'm not going to the, announce the next a election? specific date. Well, yeah, before indeed, the next election? Absolutely, very shortly. Uh, but I'm not going to give a okay. date this morning. Very a huge shortly. amount of work has gone in to okay. this. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's something that we're having okay. discussions on as we speak. OK, the Chancellor has uh, appeared in our conversation already this morning. Um, he said to my colleague Ed Conway, uh, Sky's Data and Economics editor on Friday... Uh, when Ed asked him if he was comfortable with Bank of England doing whatever it takes to bring down inflation, even if it precipitates a recession, Jeremy Hunt said, yes, because the inflation is a source of instability. There's nothing automatic about bringing down inflation. It's a big task, but we must deliver it, and we will. Your last um, job, I think, was in the Treasury. Um, recession is a price worth paying. You OK with that? Well, we've been clear, the Prime Minister's uh, five key commitments includes growing the economy, and I was very pleased to see that the IMF rated 
uh, our growth, 0.7% yep. uh, increase. So we do need to halve inflation. We need to grow the economy and we need to reduce debt. And that is why those are the first three key commitments from the Prime Minister in terms of okay. his five pledges. Even if it means a recession with attendant levels of unemployment, impact on living standards and indeed, by the way, uh, impact on public spending, which means you probably won't get the money that you want from the Treasury. That's all fine or acceptable if it brings down inflation. No, if it brings down no, what inflation. What I'm saying is we need to grow the economy. That's the second of the Prime Minister's commitments. And the IMF said that the Chancellor had acted decisively. That was reflected in the uprating of our growth forecast from the IMF just this week. So growing the economy is one of the Prime Minister's five pledges. We're committed to doing so, just, just as we are to cutting it's, waiting times. So my it, focus in terms of the Health Secretary, through announcements this week, like on patient choice, empowering patients, the yeah, Patients on, Association come, saying come that on. could take three months uh, off people's waiting times. That's what we're focusing as... as come the, on, no, the, we, we, we got a glimpse of honesty from, from the Chancellor. Uh, Mr Sunak's pledge one, bring down inflation, pledge two, bring, uh, raise growth. Sometimes those two things are going to be in conflict and the Chancellor's been very honest. He says inflation is number one target for a reason and if that means, you know, that we have a recession, so be it. Doesn't want it, but it might be. Why can't you say the same? Well, do, do you disagree with him you or started, don't you? You started the interview talking about the cost of the new hospitals programme and clearly one of the areas where inflation has an impact is on construction costs, building materials, uh, double-digit increase at the moment. So the impact on inflation is important to the NHS, but what we have seen from the Prime Minister and from the Chancellor is their commitment to funding the NHS. 6.6 .6 billion contributed at the autumn statement additionally to the NHS, and most importantly, up okay. to 7.5 billion for adult social care, because how we integrate health All and right. social care is hugely important. So All the right. priority let at the autumn statement was health and social care funding, and we have a right. commitment let from the let Chancellor. Let let's just get to the nub of what the difficulty is here. All this means borrowing and the cost of borrowing is climbing. Um, uh, we had a look at the, uh, the bond yields uh, and here we can see it. Look, you're up to uh, get four point four and a third percent now, which if I, um, if I read it rightly, this is the highest April figure for borrowing cost since 1997. You are not going to be able to afford any of this because of the borrowing costs, are you? Well, as I say, the IMF uh, commented this week that the Chancellor has yeah, that, acted decisively. Don't, don't, don't appeal to the IMF, because every time they say that, that you're in trouble, you say what a load of rubbish they are. Let's just deal with what well, you usually think. Usually you quote them in the inter interviews. I, I don't. Do, so. I'm not quoting them. <laughs> so I've just uh, responded to that. I didn't but, quote them. These are your numbers. But my focus as Health Secretary is to get the waiting times down, and that is what we're doing. If you look at the contrast between our approach in England, which is working, where two-year waits were eliminated virtually in the summer, 18-month uh, waits down below 11,000. Uh, if you look at the contrast uh, uh, with so Wales, sorry, where in Wales it was 74,000 uh, uh, for I'm, 18 I'm, I'm waits, 18-month so waits. So I, I, that's what we're I, focusing I on. The Chancellor back. obviously is looking at uh, the economic but, side, but what we're doing on the health side but is the getting point, our waiting time down. But the point down. is you were responsible at one point for this role, and you know with borrowing costs at that level, the Chancellor cannot do all the things that you've just been talking about. Well, you that's why the Prime Minister has set out the five pledges he has in terms of halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing okay. debt. But the fourth one is the one that... And I core inflation went up. The fourth one is the one that... Core I, inflation I, went up from, I think, 6.2% to 6.8%, which is why you've got those interest rates climbing. Well, CPI has come down, uh, and it's good to see uh, that coming down. So inflation has come down, but we need okay. to, to go further. But my focus as Health Secretary is on the fourth pledge, right. cutting waiting times, and just look at the contrast between between England and Wales on two years' waits, on 18-month waits. Well, Wales, with a much smaller population, has around 74,000 patients waiting more than 18 months. We got that I, down to below 11,000 at the end of the month. And I, I, I won't say it, say it for you, late, Wales has got a Labour government on. Here, you say you want to cut waiting times. One of the ways you're going to cut waiting times is by having more people in hospitals, more no, doctors and nurses, because that's mm. a control factor. Um, 
Suella Braverman wants to reduce the number of people coming into the country. Let's just first ask you this. Um, do you think that people who voted Brexit understood that when you said take back control, that meant uh, controlling immigration to the highest net number in our history, 606,000 this week? Well, as a Brexiteer, when people talked about taking back control, it was about the ability to decide who we bring in and what works best for our economy. And that's why we are expanding the medical workforce. More than uh, yeah, 5,000 doctors could Yeah, on the doorstep, they weren't year. saying that. They well, were saying it, to control in order to bring it down, not to get to 606,000. It, it, it was to things like stop the, the small boats and the illegal migration. No, no, it was no, no. we're talking illegal migration. 606,000. But on doctors, we, you're right, we do need more doctors and nurses in our hospitals. That's why we've got over 5,000 more doctors, over 11,000 more nurses than this time last year. So we are increasing our workforce. Now, part of the... So when you, say the... That to the, when you say that to the Home Secretary, she says, oh, absolutely, Stephen, absolutely. I completely agree. What we need to do is to make sure... that even though I'm going to bring the, the numbers down to, she said last year, less than 100,000, we're going to make sure we have more doctors. Well, the Home Secretary is absolutely right on the need to bring the numbers down, and the Prime Minister uh, mm. reaffirmed his commitment to bringing the overall numbers down. I think there's a distinction to draw between between, for example, some of the abuse of student routes, people coming in on a student visa and then changing, uh, looking at the number of dependents, and we announced this week uh, a tightening of controls, particularly where people are coming on undergraduate student courses uh, and dependents are coming as well. So there's areas, of course, the numbers have spiked because of Ukraine and Hong Kong, more than 100,000 from Ukraine, yeah, come on. over 50, and I think that's something most people come, actually welcome and accept. Come on, so but there has been, come on. well, the ONS. No, no, well, the you're one themselves. of the few politicians that I know can actually add up. You can do maths. You reduce the numbers from 600,000 to below 100,000. It's half a million uh, people out of the immigration figures. Where are your doctors and nurses going to come from? Well, if we you're, have... If you're, if you're stopping half a million people... We're, we're confusing You're not getting more doctors and nurses, are you? I think we're confusing two different things. So, firstly... No, 600,000 legal migration, which includes your doctors and nurses. I think, as the ONS themselves said, there was a spike because of Ukraine on Hong Kong, which I think most viewers accept was the responsible thing for the UK when to you, do. And you, when thing. you strip out the, I think it's about 320,000 Ukrainians and Hong Kongers, you still got more than four or 500,000. Well, which is why on Tuesday the Home Secretary announced a tightening of the rules, particularly around dependence uh, of students, looking at some of the enforcement around okay. student moves. So there's things there. And in terms of the medical community in the NHS, it's two things. We do need international okay. recruitment. That is something that the NHS has already always relied on. But we also need to grow our right. domestic supply. And that's what the long-term workforce plan, which quite rightly okay. you highlighted okay. earlier, is about growing <laughs> our domestic still waiting supply. For it. All right, look, bef before uh, I let you go, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but there's one person who can seem, never seem to uh, get out of the news, and that is your former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Um, is it all over for him? He, claim, he says that the uh, claims that are uh, being made about yet new issues for him are all nonsense. Um, he's got his hand over... The Cabinet Office has to hand over... Uh, the unredacted WhatsApp me messages from him to the COVID inquiry, and he's now got himself a new legal team. So it's all a terrible mess. But is Boris Johnson toast now? No, I think Boris has a huge role to, to play. We saw his leadership in the country's response to Ukraine, uh, where he took the, the lead on that. I think that... Yeah, but we uh, saw a lot of other things. But I just want to talk to you about where Boris Johnson is now. Do you want him back in the next parliament? Uh, of course I want all my colleagues back in the next parliament. Do you want and Boris Johnson to be back as, a, as MP for Uxbridge with all the distraction? And we're talking about him now. Of course, I, I, I want to see Boris back. Uh, as a member of parliament, and I want to see all my Back in the uh, cabinet, maybe? Uh, back. Well, uh, the cabinet's for the, the prime minister. That's above uh, my pay yeah, grade. Okay. But uh, the point is, uh, you know, Boris achieved many things. The, the speed of the, 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 the COVID rollout, so look at our response in Ukraine. If I take my announcement this week, the new hospitals programme, the 40 new hospitals, was something he has championed, including uh, for H Hillingdon, 
in his own constituency. So, so there's many things that I've worked with with Boris on. So, you, so you're signing up to the Bring Back Boris uh, campaign, you're, are you? are trying to characterise things in, in different ways. What I'm saying is, within the health sphere, what I am focused on is empowering patients more. That's why we made the okay. announcement this week on patient choice, but also getting that investment into the NHS estate. And we also have the 40 new hospitals announcement, which is the biggest investment uh, of capital in our NHS uh, hospital estate, over £20 billion. Pounds. Steve Barclay, thank you very much indeed. That was the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay. Let's get the view from Labour now. The party says it would reform welfare to tackle a crisis in sickness-related work absence. So let's talk to the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth. Good morning, Mr Ashworth. Good let's morning. Just, let's just start, if we may, with um, the report that Keir Starmer wants to stop all new oil and gas exploration. Is that true? Well, what we'll be doing in our coming weeks is outlining how we want to uh, invest in the green jobs of the future to bring bills down, to create a more sustainable energy supply. We'll be outlining that in a significant mission in the, in the coming weeks and we'll be announcing more details then. But we know we've got to move to more renewable sources of energy, it's, the, it's, it's important for our climate change commitments, but it's also the way in which we can bring energy bills down for consumers. OK, that, that's interesting. Sounds very much like a, a yes, uh, Mr Ashworth. Um, and if you do stop all new oil and gas exploration with old fields being uh, shut down, uh, where does that leave your celebrated windfall tax, uh, number one. And number two, doesn't that mean that you're going to ask Britain to rely in the transition to net zero, next 30 years or so, uh, on supplies from other sources, for example, Qatar, uh, perhaps even Russia again? Uh, no, this isn't about uh, shutting down uh, uh, what's going on at the moment. We will manage those sustainably. We do think a windfall tax but can be they're applied. Shut themselves to down. The... They're not inexhaustible. If you stop all new exploration, you are going to have to fill the gap from somewhere and it won't all come from wind. We know that. The, 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 the sums have been done. So where is it going to well, come it's from? A it's a, it's a mischaracterisation to say our policy is all from wind. We think we need to invest in... Yes, we do need to invest in wind. We need to invest in tidal. We need to invest in nuclear. We need more sustainable sources of energy supply in order to bring bills down for consumers and actually create jobs in this green transition. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, that will come online from a transition to low carbon uh, industries and technologies, not just directly in the, uh, uh, energy, uh, the energy sector, but associated jobs in manufacturing, in design, in engineering. We should be a world leader in this. And one of the things that I want to do in, when I, in the way in which I reform welfare, reform the job centres, is prepare our workforce for the next wave of jobs which is coming, the next sets of opportunities, so that we are ready for these high-skilled jobs of the future. All right. Let, let, let's talk about the first term uh, in your title, which is work, uh, as you say, jobs. And let's talk about who's going to fill those jobs when we've still got a million vacancies. Um, legal migration. Uh, the Labour Home, former Labour Home Secretary, uh, Alan Johnson, reminded everybody yesterday that the present point system was introduced by Labour. Um, you weren't there at the time, but do you think that the then Labour government um, of Tony Blair foresaw that it would lead to the highest net immigration figure in history? Well, that, that high figure that we're discussing is on the Conservatives' watch. And they gave us... Did it come uh, from uh, the system uh, that you uh, introduced? Let's, let's not blame the Tories for everything. You're, it was your system. Well, uh, well, by the way, I wasn't an MP then, and this government has been in power for 13 years, so I'm sorry that I'm going to focus on the 13 years of this government and not something that was happening when I was at school and university. Look, the immigration system, we, we want to see migration lower than it is, but immigration is, in many ways, a reflection of your health of the labour market. And when you've got a million people unemployed today and a million vacancies, when you've got 700,000 young people neither in work or training or education, 
And when you've got hundreds of thousands of over 50s and people who are currently signed off sick but say they would want to work if given the right support, then I believe we should be skilling people, investing in people's training, fixing the red tape and bureaucracy in the e-apprenticeship levy, but also fixing the way our welfare system works and our job centres work to give people the skills and opportunities to move into work. Ministers cannot even tell you how many of that 1.3 million people unemployed and on benefits are actually on a training programme. They don't even collect that data. I think that is utterly hopeless when we know that firms are trying to fill vacancies in this country today. All right. You, 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 your party wants to be in government. So let's, if we may, just talk about you rather than uh, do a critique of the, the, the current government. Um, you have advanced a policy, I understand, this week of restricting employers' right to bring workers from abroad uh, putting in new hurdles there and regulating pay in order to force them uh, to train British workers. Is this a return to Gordon Brown's mantra of British jobs for British workers? Now, what this is, is about saying to firms, we, you should be investing in the workforce that you've got or the potential future workers by investing in their skills and retraining opportunities rather than pulling the lever of going straight to international recruitment and undercutting the wages by cutting those wages by 20%. We don't think that is fair. But as I say, when you have How are you going to force them to do that? Well, well, we would actually... This is about the... Uh, this, these are the rules associated with who are on the, uh, uh, the, the shortage uh, occupations list. So we would enforce that. These are, this is about government statutory regulatory rules. So we would enforce that. But the second thing is that we would do, which a Labour government would do, is we're going to reform the way our job centres work. We're actually going to give more power and responsibilities to local areas so they can redesign the types of training that is on offer. So at the moment, all you get, if you go to a job centre, all you get is essentially CV writing training. Well, when you've got AI coming along, which is going to write the CVs for you, you really need a new way in which you can train and retrain people and upskill people for the future. So that's one of the things we're going to do. And here's a very significant welfare reform that I am proposing. Yeah. If you're off work for reasons of sickness at the moment and you've been through something called the work capability assessment, that acts as a disincentive for you trying to return to work. So I will give people an into-work guarantee by reforming those assessments. So reforms to the, to the apprenticeship levy, uh, reforms to the way job centres train people, reforms to the benefit system, reforms to the immigration system. That's a substantial package of reform to get more people back to work right. and more people into the jobs of the future. Thank you. Well, let, let, let's dig into that, because you've talked this morning about exactly uh, that uh, programme of work. One of the things I noticed in your announcement you talked about was tailored job support. Is that um, code for forcing people back to work? Well, at the moment, people who are on... Um, it's now called universal credit, as you know, Trevor, but essentially the old job seekers uh, related benefit, there are conditions attached. There are conditions attached to people claiming those benefits, and we will keep those conditions. We will want people to move into jobs, but we'll also offer people decent training and reskilling opportunities. At the moment, but, you get but, sent to a sort but, of CV but they're offered that, class. But, but, I don't think that's good enough. But, but they're offered that already, and I, I'm, I'm interested in this because... Uh, you know, it's what governments do. They are honest with the people. And it seems to me that what you are saying is that you are going to be tougher on people who are currently on, uh, as you say, universal bene or sickness benefits. Uh, is that correct? Well, I, I, I mean, the word tougher has, brings me all kinds of connotations. I'm going to have a fair system. Well, it's just a, a fact. A fair system giving people giving people the support and the help that they need to move into work. Let me give you an absolutely astonishing statistic. Older people out of work and sick and disabled people out of work, even though many of them say they want help to move into work, only one in ten are getting any support to move into a job. I think that is absolutely extraordinary and is writing off huge numbers of people who's, who have got huge, who've got huge potential to contribute and who say they actually want to work. So we've got to reform this job centre system. 
and we've got to reform the way in which our, our benefit assessment system works. Okay. They are some of the practical reforms I am putting forward which will help people get back to work. Because I don't think it's acceptable. Look, actually, the government actually copied some of my reforms. They said they're going to do <laughs> them, right. but actually they're not going to do them for years and years. They're relying on international recruitment. All right. John of Bathurst, thank you very much for your time this morning. You're watching Sophie Ridge on Sunday this week with me, Trevor Phillips. Still to come on the programme this morning. In just a moment, I'll speak to the Labour Chair of the House of Commons Standards Committee. That's Chris Bryant. And a little later, we'll hear from the Conservative MP and Brexiteer, Andrea Jenkins. But first, let's get some immediate reaction from our deputy political uh, editor, the guru, Sam Coates, who's been watching all our interviews. Sam, um, what have you heard that interests you this morning? I thought what the interview with Steve Barclay, the health secretary, drew out very well was just the sheer scale of problems facing the government at the moment. Well, you were quizzing him about those 40 hospitals that were promised by... 2030. The truth is, and he couldn't quite bring himself to say it in as clear terms as this, but they've pushed eight of the 40 back to the other side of 2030 because they're having to cope with other problems. But that's just one issue in the in-tray of ministers at the moment. At the top of the list, pretty much, is that there are red flashing lights on the dashboard of the economy. Yes, the IMF did say that the government's uh, growth forecast, they upgraded Britain's growth forecasts, but there is a big looming problem. The cost of borrowing, as you were putting to Steve Barclay, is going up. That's going to make doing things for this government more expensive. It's also going to push up millions of people's mortgages. If the economy is going to get worse and growth is potentially going to stall because of that, and I think the Tories are in for a very difficult year when they thought they were going to be able to rely on some green shoots. OK, thanks, Sam. And thank you, by the way. I got that uh, borrowing figure from your, um, your long read on the Sky News website. But we'll, we'll talk more about it later on. Thanks very much. Now, it's a cliché to say that Boris Johnson is never far from the headlines. But I think we've got to roll it out this week, as the former Prime Minister was once again all over the news, with new allegations of lockdown breaking and diaries passed to the police. Then there was a row between the COVID inquiry and the Cabinet Office over his WhatsApp messages. And then another argument over his government-appointed lawyers. Oh, well, Sky News spoke to him exclusively in the United States, and this is what he said about those new claims. This whole thing is a load of nonsense. Uh, from beginning to end, and uh, I, we made that clear in the, the statements that I've issued. Um, I think that it's ridiculous that ele elements in my diary should be cherry-picked and handed over to uh, the police, uh, to the Privileges Committee, uh, without even anybody having the, the basic common sense to ask me what these entries referred to. What do the, they refer to? There, there is absolutely nothing in those entries that constitutes uh, rule-breaking during COVID restrictions, OK? Mingling and with friends whole, at checkers. No, when you shouldn't that, have no been. that is absolutely not what those diary entries show. That is not what those diary entries show. And the whole thing is totally nonsensical. Well, look, if we can find our way through the murk. This coming Tuesday is a deadline for the Cabinet Office to provide unredacted WhatsApp messages to and from Boris Johnson to the COVID inquiry. Plus, the House of Commons Privileges Committee is due to deliver its verdict soon on whether the former Prime Minister midless misled the House. And that's likely to provoke another almighty row. And in just a moment, we'll speak to the Conservative MP and Boris Johnson supporter, Andrea Jenkins. But first, let's talk to the chair of the Committee on Standards, uh, Chris Bryant. Good, Good morning, 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 Mr Bryant. Thank, thank you very much for joining us. Um, now, we've just heard uh, Boris Johnson flatly denying fresh allegations of lockdown rule breaking and so on. He says nothing to see here. Um, and I know you can't get into the details because you're chair of the Standards Committee, but um, what's your immediate reaction to uh, his assertion? Well, the, the trouble with Boris Johnson is that we have heard him deny things in the past, which has subsequently turned out to be true. I, 
I can't remember the inverted. What was it? His line was an inverted pyramid. Pyramid of piffle. Of piffle. Yes, I can't remember what, what that was, but anyway, it proved to be completely and utterly true and not an inverted pyramid of piffle at all. So, um, and, and it is true that sometimes Boris Johnson finds himself innocent in the court of his own opinion, but, um, and you're right, I, I'm very hesitant to get into the specifics of this case because, um, A, there's potentially a police investigation, B, there's the privileges inquiry, which I'm not party to, I recuse myself um, from, from chairing that because I believe that I, I already had a view as to whether Boris Johnson has misled Parliament and done so recklessly or deliberately. Um, I, I wonder and, what that might be, Mr Bryant. <laughs> uh, well, yes, it's very publicly known. I, I think he did. It, it's, it seems to me self-evident that if you turned up to events um, at which, uh, which were subsequent, for which you were subsequently fined, you probably knew that there were events going on in Parliament that didn't meet the legal requirement um, and that you weren't abiding by your own lockdown rules and that there were parties in Parliament and therefore what you had told Parliament was not true. And if you then chose not to correct the record in time, or at all, ever, in fact, up, up until this day, then probably you have not only um, accidentally or inadvertently misled Parliament, you've probably deliberately done so or certainly um, allowed the misleading of Parliament to stand. And that is a culpable contempt of Parliament, in my view. But I'm not on the committee, so that's almost completely and utterly irrelevant. What, the, the thing that worries me most at the moment, if, if I might, Trevor, is um, so we've got the COVID inquiry, we've got the police investigation, we've got the, in, the, the inquiry by the Privileges Committee. We've also in the last week um, had the Ministerial Code, um, uh, a decision on the Ministerial Code in relation to Suella Braverman. I think that was an odd decision, but be that as it may, that's yet another body that's been doing an investigation. Um, you also have, um, this week, there have been uh, stories in the press today that MPs have been claiming, or some MPs have been claiming, um, speeding or parking fines on their expenses. Um, and that is regulated by yet another body, which is IPSA, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority. Ma um, sorry, and may I, I just, just stop worry. You? Yep. Ma may I just ask you, actually, I, I want you to come to that point about uh, MPs claiming uh, the cost of parking fines on their expenses. Two things. First of all, um, are you going to be investigating that through your committee, number one? And number two, from what we know the rules at the moment, is that actually wrong? Uh, well, it, it, as I was about to explain, weirdly, um, the rules on expenses are governed by IPSA, a separate body, and my committee the Standards Committee has no power to investigate... Um, well, in fact, we can't investigate anything. It's only the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards investigates if he thinks there might have been a breach of the rules and then reports to us and then we adjudicate on them. Um, but IPSA is a statutory body, so it's laid down in statute law, and it has a um, uh, an officer who is there solely to decide whether people have breached the, um, the rules, and they would then refer things to the police because it's a criminal offence to, to um, uh, false accounting or, or, break, or breaking the laws on um, parliamentary expenses. So, no, we can't investigate. Um, it, uh, to my mind, it is manifestly wrong. I don't care whether it breaches a rule. It is manifestly wrong for somebody to, you know, if you're an ordinary member of the public, you can't go off and, uh, if you uh, parked... Uh, if you've been caught parking in the wrong t in the wrong place at the wrong time or not having a, uh, getting a parking ticket or a speeding fine, you can't claim that on your daily expenses, can you? So I Sad don't see why there should be a, why why MPs should be any different. Sad sadly, Sky is not that kind to to us, and um, of course we have to say that we we don't know who those MPs are, and they can't be here to answer for themselves. But um, you set out no. the principle very clearly. Um, there's a general issue, I think, which is now building up, which is the relationship between politicians and the civil service. Uh, on Tuesday, the Cabinet Office has a deadline, and that's a deadline for uh, sending the unredacted versions of Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages to the COVID inquiry. COVID inquiries demanded them. Um, do you feel confident that the Cabinet Office is behaving correctly and that the inquiry is getting what it needs from the government? Well, 
I, I, I read, you know, you can't believe everything you read in newspapers, as you know, Trevor, but um, I, I read a newspaper account which seemed to suggest that the COVID inquiry was having to use um, powers, which incidentally, not even my committee, the Standards Committee in Parliament has, um, and, and the COVID inquiry has them under the um, Inquiries Act to force government ministers to provide things. Um, there shouldn't be, you would have thought that, well, it's the fundamental principle of good government that openness and transparency um, is there. The ministerial code says in terms that no minister shall ever refuse to provide some information unless it is um, legally necessary to do so. Um, and so I think there's a danger here that if the COVID inquiry doesn't get everything it needs in a timely fashion, that it will feel to the British people as if ministers are trying to obstruct um, uh, a proper inquiry. And, and that will be both a breach of the ministerial code and morally offensive. There are lots of people, you know, I mean, my constituents still want to understand why so many people died in care homes um, and there was no proper ring of protection put around them and okay. people were sent to care homes. So I think people want to know the truth is, is all I was going to say. And sorry, one month, mo 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 sorry to bang on, but one other thing. My worry is that we have so many different organisations and so many different rules that it's actually very difficult for the public and for that matter politicians to understand who's it, who's, who governs, who regulates what particular bit, the ministerial code, the civil service code, um, I think all of this is right for reform. The whole system is simply not fit for purpose anymore. OK. Chris Bryant, thank you for banging on with us this, this morning. Sorry. That's what we're, no, that's what we're here for. Thanks very much for your time. Right, let's get what I anticipate might be a slightly different perspective now. A very staunch Boris Johnson supporter seen wiping tears away as he left Downing Street. I want to speak to the Conservative MP and Deputy Chair of the Brexiteer ERG group of Tory MPs, Andrea Jenkins. Good morning. Uh, yeah, good morning, Trevor. I'm no longer deputy chairman, um, but by the way, but um, yeah, I've, I've stepped down from that when I became a whip and a minister. So, but um, uh, good, okay. good morning to you. But, but, but you are still um, an extremely influential voices, voice in those circles, I am told. Um, look, there, there are lots and lots of questions, as ever, swirling around Boris Johnson. Um, how do you react to what Chris Bryant has to say, I mean, both the words that Chris Bryant used, but also the overwhelming sense of distrust and um, uh, almost, I suppose, contempt for Mr Johnson. Um, before I answer that, um, which I, I'll obviously answer, Trevor, you know, because I'm quite blunt spoken. Can I just um, go back to what Jonathan Ashworth said for one second? Um, he was dissing the job centres, but we are doing amazing stuff. I was briefly the skills minister. You know, we have the boot camps, which you can get the technical skills, the HGV skills. We've got Kickstart to help people to write. So it's not just about the CV building. I just wanted to put that on the record. Now, right. regarding... Um, I mean, look, we, we know that Chris is uh, as outspoken as I am, but on the other side of the fence, and he's never like Boris. And if anything, there's there's a real hatred from the left um, of Boris Johnson, which I haven't seen um, since, you know, Thatcher's funeral, to be honest. And I, I do think it's unfair. I think lines have been blurred where the civil service is concerned. I mean, for, um, you know, for some civil previous civil servants to come out and publicly say um, that I, you know, was responsible for bringing Boris Johnson down. Um, when you see that, um, you know, part of um, the inquiry, we hear that the head of ethics brought their own karaoke machine to the civil service party, yet Boris got the blame for stuff, um, the, all these parties. So I, I, I would like to see greater transparency, not only uh, if the civil service have got this orchestrated campaign and they are trying to, like, stop our immigration policy, et cetera, I think we need to see more transparency um, with the civil service and they declare their interests uh, and their relations uh, with not only the media, but, uh, but um, <laughs> with shadow cabinet as well. I, 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 I'm going to come back to, to, to ask you about uh, the, the, what you said about the civil service, which you mentioned several times. But just before we get there, is, is Boris Johnson not responsible for any of this? I mean, is he a sort of totally innocent party? I, I, I think, if anything, Boris has probably been too trusting. 
um, you know, Boris. Oh, he's, um, oh, he, Boris is, he's been a little Lord Fauntleroy along all of this, and um, just wandered through and been, you know, the victim of awful, devious other people. No, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I, I've seen the hatred out there and the vitriol. That's why outside Downing Street, I got frustrated. You know, the, the left yeah. got what they want. And I think that they need to leave Boris alone now. Carrie's heavily pregnant. Just leave him alone. And I, what I really do question, Trevor, is the timing of this. Um, no, no, you know, no. So, I, I sorry, you're, you're, you're slightly, you're being a bit of a politician here. You're sliding away from my, my, my basic question here. Oh, Whatever you but, say about what's being said about Boris Johnson, yeah. I, are you just saying that, he nothing he has done is worthy of question or inquiry, and he made no mistakes. Look, uh, every prime minister, and I'm not, and I'm not evading the question here, um, Trevor. But every prime minister, you know, should be questioned. I mean, this is why I'm questioning our current prime minister over certain policies, like dropping the annual welfare bill. And you know, I, I will be a, a, a critic. I was with Theresa May in our own party. But with Boris, I do feel that, no, clearly that, you know, he, um, he, nobody's perfect without a doubt. Um, but there has seriously been That's an orchestrated campaign. That's a relief to hear you campaign. say that. that no, but this, uh, honestly, there's been an orchestrated campaign. And not only in my own party as well, because let's face it, you know, most of my um, fellow MPs are the one nation to the left of the party. They've got the leader that they wanted um, in Rishi, um, they never accepted Boris and never accepted Liz Truss, and they are they're out of sync with the party membership, who are big Boris fans. All right, let, I, mean, I, was... uh, I just want to ask you about the important point you made here, really, which is about the role of the civil service. Um, do you think it's right that the cabinet office handed over Boris's diaries to the privileges committee, and as a result, they ended up in the hands of the police? Um, I'm going with my personal view on this. My personal view is, you know, no. And and why did it, uh, they should have at least let Boris Johnson know um, um, that they had concerns. But I go back to the timing of this. Why all of a sudden, when the COVID inquiry is wrapping up and um, we saw with a... Um, with a committee um, that, um, that didn't really, um, it, it wasn't strong evidence, I didn't feel. I thought Boris came out very well in the committee. Um, so I just question the timing of this as well, to be honest. All right. Well, as you say, you've been pretty blunt. I mean, you've been pretty blunt on WhatsApp. And um, I think uh, we've seen some of your messages this week. Um, you talked about hypocrisy and sanctimony. Um, yeah. Do you want to... Tell us names and names. Who are you talking about? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the person at the top, Simon Hall. Um, our, during um, Theresa May's time, you know, he was quite vitriolic on social media. I had to block him in the end. So the, the say about blue on blue and, um, you know, let's keep this in house, etc. But it, those who throw the first stone, you know, that they, they, um, that they need to make sure that they're not devoid of doing the same thing. <laughs> OK, so, so you've got Simon I, Hall. I who, 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 who else is in the enemy crew? <laughs> I mean, not enemies. I mean, I have to set the record straight with this. Uh, you know, we, we'd all much rather see the uh, a conservative government than a socialist government um, with all their woke arati agenda. So, um, I mean, I also blocked uh, the chief whip during that time, um, who's now the chief whip. So, you know, these, <laughs> to, to me, <laughs> you cannot... <laughs> Sorry, go with, on, Trevor. With, 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 with the greatest of, of respect, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a novice in politics, but uh, I have to say, if you want to see a Conservative government, um, yeah. these WhatsApp messages, bring back Boris and all of that, uh, Rishi, always oh, a bit weak, uh, all of the things that you've been saying, they, they don't seem like the best message to send to the electorate if what you want to do is to get the Conservatives re-elected. I, I mean, um, look, I... I, Boris and Liz was a prime minister's and, you know, the party leaders who I supported. I didn't support Rishi. And, um, you know, that's life. Under Theresa May's time, we, um, I mean, when Boris got elected, we saw members of the party who w wasn't happy with that. But, oh. I mean, ultimately, we do want to see a Conservative um, elected. And, and if anything, Trevor, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be outspoken, which I can't be anything else. I'm a Yorkshire woman and I've been brought up to be honest and blunt. Um, I, and I, if, if anything, I'm trying to, you know, 
actually uh, challenge uh, some of the policies that's coming out at the moment to because I know what policies are working in my area and actually to, live, to deliver on our manifesto commitments. OK, just very quickly on a yes or no. So being blunt, Rishi Sunak, you want him to be leader uh, when you go into the next election. You're happy, you're going you're, you're, you're to stick with it now. <laughs> well, as I've said publicly, I am, I, I, to me, it depends on the polling, Trevor. I mean, uh, this is me personally. Oh, it'd right. Be, Re well, so come on, it'd be political suicide to, um, look, come on, I'm a pragmatist as well. It'd be pretty political suicide okay. to change leader again now because we'd have to go into a general election and what, we'll end up with 100 seats? It, Why would you do it, that? I want to see a Conservative government elected. It, it, sounds, it sounds like Rishi's on probation. Have, have any of the no-confidence letters gone gone in yet? Um, I haven't a clue. You know, you, you'll have to yeah. ask... Um, you, 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 you haven't submitted one, have you? I mean, I know you've... No, you've, you've no, probably I got, mean... I, I'm very public. Look, when I submitted one over Theresa May, okay. I, I was public about that. So if I if I'd submitted one, you, um, you know, I, I would put it out there. All right. Look, I, the last last point. I, I just want to ask you on behalf of my dear friend and colleague Sam Coates, um, <laughs> yeah. when he broke the, the the story on on Thursday, you had a go at him. I mean, honestly. I but no, oh, come on, but, come on, Trevor. I mean, I Sam, I Sam is that. not a woke fest. I mean, honestly, <laughs> you're, you're impugning the integrity uh, of one of the best reporters around, and with it, the but entire I, Sky crew. I feel Trevor, personally I like, affronted. No, come on, Trevor. I, I like Sam, and um, and you're pretty decent as well. But but come on, we, we know that the media that they're, they're waiting to you know stories to hear that the party's falling apart. But but we're not. You know, if you look at, I'm sure the Labour MPs WhatsApp, you know, you get people who's happy and not happy. And it's been very leaky for the eight years that I've been an MP. So that's politics. OK. And, and by the way, that BBBJ hashtag, I, I didn't quite get what it meant. <laughs> oh, bring back Boris Johnson, of course, yeah. I mean, not that he and, wants to come back. I don't believe he does. But, but just... <laughs> Andrew, Andrew yeah, Jenkins, we, we, we really then. ought to do this. People. We really ought to do this again. Thank you so much for your time this <laughs> Thank morning. Thank you. All the best. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Gosh, that's the first time an MP's described me as pretty decent. Anyway, let's get back to uh, other matters. You'll be forgiven for being a bit confused when it comes to migration. Home Secretary's once again in the Sunday papers, promising to bring migration numbers down, something Home Secretaries and Prime Ministers have been doing for years. The thing is, the migration numbers went up yet again to a new record, all, of course, after we've left the EU. Here's the state of play over the last few years. Last year, net migration, the number of people coming here, minus those leaving, hit more than 600,000. So what's going on? Uh, well, I can speak to someone who should know and studies the facts. Professor Brian Bell is chair of the government's Migration Advisory Committee, and he's here with me. Good morning, Professor Bell. Morning. Um, we can see the spikes in net migration uh, in the last couple of years. Um, there are a lot of people coming here from on schemes from Ukraine and Hong Kong and so on, but actually there is a longer-term trend, isn't there? Can you talk us through what the underlying numbers are and why they're so high? So I think that chart's quite a useful chart in the sense that um, if you strip out the big changes in the last year or two, we'll actually have a long-run net migration number of around 200 to 250,000. So the sort of numbers we were seeing 2017 to 2019 will actually be where we'll get back to within the year or two. The big rise in the last couple of years, three big, three big reasons. One, the humanitarian schemes you've mentioned, uh, an increase in students. The universities have been recruiting a lot more international students in the last couple of years. And there's been an increase in the work visa programme. Some of that's temporary, and so we will get those numbers down. They will come down in the next few years. We'd expect to around about a quarter of a million, but they won't go any further than that. That's where the long-run trend is. Leaving aside the humanitarian uh, issues, um, can we talk about what's in the government's control? As you said, the, the government's made some changes to rules on workers and students. Um, do you think that the government's policy itself has contributed to these increases? Uh, well, I mean, clearly it has. I mean, the government has, for example, an international education strategy that says that universities should aim for 600,000 international students. The universities have delivered that. But you have to issue visas to those international students, so inevitably the net migration number goes up. 
Similarly, um, you know, most of the work route, uh, the majority of visas on that work route are issued to the health and social care sector, which is the one bit of the economy that the government control. So, you know, if you're going to bring in nurses, doctors, social care workers, you're going to have to issue visas for them. Uh, are you as confused as the rest of us by one part of government saying, let's kick up the numbers, more students, uh, more people uh, in health service and so on, and another part of government saying, let's get, it, get the numbers down to, uh, the net number, down to a sixth of what uh, they currently are? Well, I think there is a problem that um, if, if the government says we, are, we have an objective of getting net migration down to a certain level, they haven't, haven't actually come up with an explicit number. But if they're committed to doing that, you can't then say, but we need more visas on this route, we need more visas on that route. There needs to be some consistency. I think one thing that would be helpful would be if the government focused on the long-run numbers. So don't worry too much about the fact that it was 606,000 this year. We understand why that was. Um, the more interesting question is, if you get back to the average of about 250,000, is that acceptable? And if it's not, you will have to change policy to bring it further down. Oh, that's interesting. So, for example, you might think of a metric that looks like, I don't know, a three-year or a five-year rolling average as the way of understanding what's happening. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, that's exactly what you need to do, because otherwise you come up with perverse policy. I mean, everyone supported the humanitarian schemes for Ukraine and Hong Kong. I don't think a single politician spoke out against it. Well, that inevitably resulted in a couple of hundred thousand extra visas. It would be bizarre if our policy response to that was, let's instantly slash some other part of the immigration system for that temporary increase. Let's think about the longer term and the more sort of stable position. that. They... So one change might be the way in which we... Uh, the headline figure, uh, which uh, the government uh, advertises. Yeah, so indeed, you could... I mean, you know, there's nothing to stop... Um, the Office of National Statistics publishing a range of numbers, and they could publish numbers trying to strip out, for example, temporary factors to see what... A bit like in inflation, we often look at the core inflation rate to focus on what the underlying inflation trends are rather than the headline rate. There are a couple of um, peculiarities in the numbers which I've, looked, I've seen and other people have picked up on. Um, for example, there are more Nigerian dependents of students than there are actual Nigerian students. Now, of course, you know, any student might bring partner and uh, a child, but it does seem quite an odd balance. So there's been a big change uh, in the last couple of years, and the government have obviously focused on this in their policy announcement this week. Um, I think part of it is probably the type of courses that students are choosing to do. So I think some of the expansion that we've seen are in one-year master's programmes in more vocational areas. And that's likely to bring in an older um, demographic than a, you know, a, a straightforward master's degree that's more academically focused. So perhaps it's more not surprising that they're more likely to have families with them. OK. The other thing which I was um, uh, as interested, I, I did not know this, we include Brits coming back to the UK uh, in these numbers, the 1.2 total who are coming in and so on. Um, and they account actually for 8%, uh, one in 13 of the numbers. Um, does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to count them because net migration is trying to measure whether the population's going up or down. And if more Brits come back from abroad than go abroad, that is increasing the population. So it's right to include them. I think it would be probably more sensible if, when we're thinking of policy to forget about that group, because I can't believe there's any minister in any political party that's going to start legislating against freedom of movement of British people into Britain. Let's talk about what is actually possible. The government says migration is too high. Um, the opposition, we don't, not quite sure what they, but they think, but they certainly don't want to be higher. Um, do you think it is actually possible uh, by an act of will to bring down these num numbers by more than an, a sort of you know, accidental number to, say, reduce them by, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000, a quarter of a million? I mean, in one sense, it's absolutely possible because the government has control of the immigration system. So having left the European Union, we control all elements, almost all elements, of the immigration system. So if they want to bring the numbers down, they can change the, the rules. I think the difficulty is, as we referred to earlier, is the difficulty of getting that past all the other government ministers that might have other priorities. So, for example, you could ban all workers coming into Britain. That would definitely reduce the net <laughs> migration numbers. It would be a pretty dangerous strategy to follow. But you can, you know, and so the question is, where do you tinker? And um, where do you draw the lines? Well, it's interesting. Um, last week, uh, Santony Selden, who was a vice-chancellor, uh, and Baroness Martha Lane Fox, the uh, tech entrepreneur, 
talking about education and business, both said that more worker, migrant workers and students were essential. Um, is there anything really substantial that the government could do that doesn't also kill either the education system or the... Uh, or, or the economy? Well, so let's think of the, the economy as a good one to think about. So um, we bring in um, 100... In the last year, we brought in 100,000 workers on the health and social care visa. So that's... They were much... They account for about a seventh of employment in Britain, but over half of all work visas were issued to that sector. So how do you bring in the immigration down? Well, you have two choices. You either just ban immigration, that will cause devastation in the health service, or you, I don't know, come up with a workforce plan for the National Health Service. <laughs> you pay social care workers better. And you actually create the circumstance in which more domestic workers want to work in that sector. Well, uh, the, the Labour's come up with a, a, another proposition, which is that companies pay... Uh, that, which can currently pay workers uh, to fill shortage um, jobs, as defined by, by you. They can, the employers can pay them 20% less than British workers. Um, if that policy were enacted, what effect do you think it would have? Do you think it would work to bring down numbers, but would it have other consequences? So, um, I should start by saying that this is a policy that the Migration Advisory Committee has recommended to the government for the last three years. We never supported the idea of uh, employers being allowed to pay below what's called the going rate, because the going rate is there to protect British workers from being undercut and to protect migrants from being exploited by bad employers. So we've always supported that. I think, actually, the government is broadly supportive of that. So I don't think there's necessarily a big political divide here. Um, it won't have an enormous effect on numbers, because, actually, the number of occupations that are eligible to pay below what's called the going rate is quite small. And even when they're able, eligible to do so, our numbers suggest that about 85% of jobs aren't actually filled below the going rate. So, it's, so it's, it won't change the net migration numbers really very much at all. What it'll do, though, is protect British workers and protect migrants, and that's important in and of itself. Professor Bell, thank you for um, a shaft of clarity there. Thank you so much indeed. That is it for this week's Sophie Ridge on Sunday. In a moment, after the break, we'll run through today's interviews and see what we learn. I'll be joined by our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Thanks for being with us this Sunday morning.
Welcome back. This is Sophie Ridge on Sunday. The Take. This morning with me, Trevor Phillips. This part of the programme is a chance to look back at our interviews this morning and try to work out what we've learned and what it means for the week ahead. I'm joined, as usual, by our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Good morning, Sam. Um, now, we talked a little bit about um, the Conservatives. Uh, speaking, as uh, Andrew Dankins tells me, the hammer of the Tories, what, what do you make of uh, what we've heard about the party's own difficulties this morning? Well, this week, uh, Sky News brought you news of the skip fire going on inside the Conservative Party. That was the phrase used by Jackie Doyle Price. Now, she's a Conservative MP, and she wrote that the Tory party risks becoming a skip fire as it engulfs in yet another round of internal debate, conversation and row about Boris Johnson. Because even though he was two prime ministers ago, conversations about the former Tory prime minister just dominate. They suck the oxygen out of the room of British politics, making life so much harder for uh, Rishi Sunak, his, uh, his successor. And I think what you heard this morning was the fact that ministers like Steve Barclay are having <coughs> to defend him. Uh, that uh, Labour figures like Chris Bryant are just agog at the sheer number of inquiries, the kind of mopping up that's having to be done after the Johnson regime. And then Andrea Jenkins, uh, Conservative MP, very much uh, into bringing back Boris Johnson, as that, uh, as that hashtag uh, on the uh, message that she sent suggests. Uh, but the, the party cannot escape, and until it can escape Boris Johnson, uh, it's going to really struggle uh, to take off uh, and uh, have a decent chance for fighting that next general election. So what really struck me this morning, uh, Trevor, was the ghost of Boris Johnson just everywhere you look in British politics. Why, why, why is it that they can't, if you like, get themselves off that drug? I think that's a very good question. It's partly because uh, uh, some of them, perhaps a minority, worry that the kinds of political talents that Boris Johnson still has for all the problems uh, were the key to the 2019 general election victory and that without those, you're not going to get a repeat of uh, uh, that in 2024. Rishi Sunak, too much of a technocrat, too much uh, of a sort of managerial figure. But I think there's... I, I, I actually think there's simply an unhealthy obsession in some senses uh, with, uh, with, with, with Boris Johnson. There's so much mopping up to be done uh, that you end up sort of... Uh, the party ends up defaulting about it. It's almost like uh, the Conservative Party's great big displacement act to be discussing uh, the former Prime Minister because it's not like there aren't other challenges. You put them to Steve Barclay very well, whether it's the rising cost of borrowing, the problems with the 40 new hospitals in the NHS uh, or issues around migration. Look, the big, big, big problems here. Uh, but it's easy to have an argy-bargy about Boris Johnson uh, amongst a lot of MPs than it is to confront those really intractable issues that can't be solved, really, when there's no money left. Well, hold on for a second. You know, people will sometimes say this is a media obsession and that the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson is back in the headlines following fresh claims and so on is, is us. But the truth is he's called the allegations total nonsense. But when I asked the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, whether... Mr Johnson's time in politics appears to be over. He wasn't quite as uh, categorical as I expected him to be. I think Boris has a huge role to, to play. We saw his leadership in the country's response to Ukraine, uh, where he took the, the lead on that. I think that... Yeah, but we uh, saw a lot of other things. But I just want to talk to you about where Boris Johnson is now. Do you want him back in the next parliament? Uh, of course I want all my colleagues back in the next parliament. Do you want and Boris Johnson to be back as, a, as MP for Uxbridge with all the distraction? And we're talking about him now. Of course I, I, I want to see Boris back. Uh, as a member of parliament, and I want to see all my Back in the uh, cabinet, maybe? Uh, back. Well, the, the cabinet's for the, the prime minister. That's above uh, my pay yeah. grade. It, it's really striking, Sam, isn't it? Because it would have been very simple for Steve Barclay to say, you know, Boris Johnson is a former prime minister. We're grateful to him for everything he's done, but he really now should uh, enjoy a period of silence and let us get on with it. But... Steve Barclay, who's sort of mainstream in the party, I think, couldn't bring himself to say that. No, I, I mean, 
Johnson's kind of a drug that the Conservative Party can't, can't sort of uh, wean itself off in some senses. Um, the, I suspect the fear uh, from Steve Barclay, who is not somebody who particularly likes to um, draw strong battle lines when he gives interviews, occasionally the kind of uh, uh, nuances, uh, every answer's nuances mean that the overall message slips through your fingers when Steve Barclay is, uh, is talking. But I suspect the reason why uh, you had a kind of on the one hand, on the other answer from Steve Barclay is he just, you know, him and Downing Street, just too afraid to pick an, a massive open fight with Boris Johnson. There's a, there's a behind the scenes fight going on. That's because uh, it's people in government who've been handing over stuff to the police, uh, allies of Boris Johnson very much gunning for the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden, who they see as responsible for that. Downing Street, I think, trying to uh, keep a lid on that skip fire uh, at the moment in order to stop that uh, bursting through uh, and causing themselves kind of big uh, political problems in the public arena. So trying to be nice about him, respecting the, the, the minority of people who are hardcore Boris supporters that are still in the party and hoping this goes away is, is pretty much the only tactic that Downing Street has. OK, well, <laughs> of course, everybody's got an opinion, not just Tories. Uh, I asked the chair of the Commons Standards Committee, Labour MP Chris Bryant, about Boris Johnson, and he pointed to a large number of investigations currently going on into a range of MPs that highlight some politicians' poor behaviour. So we've got the COVID inquiry, we've got the police investigation, we've got the, in, the, the inquiry by the Privileges Committee. We've also, in the last week, um, had the Ministerial Code, um, uh, a decision on the Ministerial Code in relation to Suella Braverman. I think that was an odd decision, but be that as it may, that's yet another body that's been doing an investigation. Um, you also have... Um, this week, there have been uh, stories in the press today that MPs have been claiming, or some MPs have been claiming, um, speeding or parking fines on their expenses. Uh, Sam, uh, it's, it's so interesting. There's all of this swirling around. And um, let's move away from Boris Johnson himself for a moment. But I think there's a school of thought that says that the Johnson period in government has affected, if you like, what's acceptable in Westminster. Now, you're, as Andrew, even Andrew Jenkins uh, acknowledged, you're kind of top observer of all of these things. It, it's, do, does that make sense to you? Um, if I was to pull the camera out, out a, bit, a bit wider, I think that uh, in the last 20 years, there has been a move, some steps towards a kind of much more fiercely partisan uh, form of uh, political uh, of, of politicisation of some bits of our politics. I don't think it started uh, by any means with Boris Johnson. I think you can see trace of it, traces of the kind of direction we've been going in, uh, going back to Tony Blair and to Gordon Brown, and certainly uh, by the time you got to, to, to David Cameron. And that's uh, and what I mean by that is uh, kind of. A sort of politicisation of some of the uh, bodies that carry out inquiries into politicians and MPs uh, and sort of uh, complaining, not because you believe that there's a problem, but because you want to uh, uh, attack your enemy uh, and uh, perhaps uh, mounting uh, more partial attacks on, uh, on, a, uh, uh, on your political opponents that don't have quite as much basis on truth as they want to. I think, I, I think this has just been an accelerating trend across the last... Uh, 25 years, really. I, I, I think there will be uh, some who point to a particular acceleration under under Boris Johnson. Certainly, uh, there have been <laughs> there's been an awful lot, and he was ultimately slung out from office because he did not uphold standards in the way that his own Conservative MPs felt was necessary. It was the handling of the uh, affair around uh, his friend Chris Pincher uh, that was the final straw for a majority of Conservative MPs. So he left under a cloud because of standards. But I do think there is a there is a bigger picture picture here. I, I'm not sure uh, whether this can ever all be put back in a box. I suspect that uh, I, the, the sort of level of shouting has, uh, has, has not gone away and, and, and won't go away. All right, let's have a listen to what Andrew Jenkins had to say after a trove of leaked WhatsApp messages between MPs was laid bare uh, this week, because I think this issue of infighting that you've just raised, Sam, uh, is has put, uh, raised its head again. Um, now, she talked about hypocrisy and sanctimony, which is what you normally say about the other lot. But when I asked her who she was referring to, 
Here's her answer. Simon Hall, um, our, during um, Theresa May's time, you know, he was quite vitriolic on social media, had to block him in the end. So the, the say about blue on blue and, um, you know, let's keep this in house, et cetera. But it, those who throw the first stone, you know, that they, they, um, that they need to make sure that they're not devoid of doing the same thing. Um, I mean, I also blocked uh, the chief whip during that time, um, who's now the chief whip. I thought it was very interesting in the last thing you said, Sam, that you went back into the Labour years where actually all the political uh, drama was within New Labour, between Blairites and Brownites, and to some extent in the last 10, 12 years with the Conservatives in government, we've seen something similar, that all the political drama is not between the, the major parties but within the governing party. Is that new? Um, I, 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 I mean, I think every every set of internal t turmoil has its own uh, has its own distinctive features. I think that um, whereas during the Labour years there were two clear poles, one represented by Gordon Brown, one represented by Tony Blair, who were who were clashing, clashing, clashing through many of the years, and all the acolytes had two poles to sort of uh, rally around. Uh, over the last fourteen years, when you've had a Conservative in Downing Street, uh, the kind of battle lines have shifted. There has been a, a kind of Tory right that was put in its box by David Cameron at the start, that is now much more vocal, much more kind of radical, and much more aggressive here. Fourteen years on, you know. <laughs> That was Andrea Jenkins having a pop at Simon Hart, who is the chief whip. She says she uh, muted him uh, uh, for some time. Uh, absolutely clear about which Tory colleagues she's uh, picking on. She did say, yes, look, but we all don't want to have a Labour government. But, but nobody could think that she's making the job of Labour, uh, keeping Labour from office any easier. Uh, there is one thing, however, the, the Tory psychodrama, which you can see on your screens now with the WhatsApps that, um, uh, that I revealed on Wednesday, the Tory psych psychodrama just sucks up the various, uh, the attempts by Labour to launch their own policy platform and get messages out. Keir Starmer had a very big speech this week on Monday. It's quite notable that we weren't really spending any time at all talking about that. We don't really and this is our bad in the media, apart from anything else, we don't really have a sense of what the different strong opposing polls within Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet are in anything like the way that uh, perhaps we did when Jeremy Corbyn was leader, uh, we did when Tony Blair and Gordon Brown uh, were prime ministers, uh, because the Tory psychodrama has been so all-consuming. This is going to end. It's going to end uh, as we approach a general election if Labour look like there's a serious chance, which it does at the moment, uh, of there being a, a Labour prime minister in Dan. Street. We are going to have to move away from this story psychodrama, uh, which uh, sucks all the oxygen out of the air, and, and, and look at where the dividing lines and the fissures and the problems are uh, within Labour much more, mu much more strongly. But at the moment, it's the Conservative Party that are falling over themselves on the telly, like they have been this morning, to tell us uh, how much they help hate certain other members of their own party and how much they don't like the policy prospectus that the Conservative Prime Minister is delivering. Uh, and that is just inescapably always going to attract the attention of the camera. OK, let's talk, let's talk about policy that might perhaps change that. I mean, people keep saying that uh, migration is not such a big issue. Well, new figures out this week show that net migration to the UK last year hit a record high over 600,000. The Home Secretary said that the figure's too high, but bringing it down could create tensions with other ministers representing sectors that need skilled migrants. So I asked Professor Brian Bell, who's the chair of the Government's Migration Advisory Committee, how those two strands of thought could come together. I think there is a problem that um, if, if the government says we, are, we have an objective of getting net migration down to a certain level, they haven't, haven't actually come up with an explicit number. But if they're committed to doing that, you can't then say, but we need more visas on this route, we need more visas on that route. There needs to be some consistency. I think one thing that would be helpful would be if the government focused on the long-run numbers. So don't worry too much about the fact that it was 606,000 this year. We understand why that was. Um, the more interesting question is, if you get back to the average of about 250,000, is that acceptable? And if it's not, you will have to change policy to bring it further down. I, I thought Brian Bell had a couple of rather interesting ideas about the way that we might uh, talk about the numbers here. But in essence, this is still 
a divisive issue both within and between the parties, isn't it? What Brian Bell did extremely eloquently was to highlight that the problem for Rishi Sunak is that migration is an issue that he controls but doesn't want to. The reason that net migration figures are high in part is because we allow in so many students. We allow in so many people to come and work in our healthcare sector. As Brian Bell said, we have allowed in a large number of people from Ukraine without commensurately taking the same number out elsewhere from our net migration figures. These high net migration figures are the consequence of government choices, yet other parts of the government are saying these numbers are too high. Actually, what's fascinating is the inherent internal contradiction in and by the government about their own policy when it comes to this. If you've got actual levers that you could pull, but very good reasons why you don't want to, because you want students, because you want to support universities, because you do need to support the NHS workforce, then don't say getting migration down is my top priority using that set of statistics that includes the pe very people that you are inviting in the country. I mean, it's, it, it, it's kind of nonsense. And yes, you can, in many ways, have different statistics, but, but really... You either have a coherent policy here or, you're, or, or you don't. And it's different bits of the Conservative Party, essentially once again arguing with each other. What we don't quite have a firm grip on is the Labour position uh, and whether or not they want to get migration dramatically down. They put an emphasis on UK workers, uh, putting UK workers first. Yes, there is a touch of, uh, you know, British jobs for British workers about it. They'll never, ever use that Gordon Brown phrase, uh, I suspect, in public. They talk about skilling up and... Uh, uh, potentially raising the minimum uh, starting salary for people coming in from abroad, something I think that quite a lot of Tories would like to do. Uh, okay. But do they want to reduce numbers dramatically? Uh, well, they don't say not, but we'll have to find okay. out. Sam, thanks very much. That's it from us on Sophie Ridge on Sunday, the take this morning. Sophie's back for the take on Wednesday evening at 9pm. <laughs>